So you've heard about Linux, and you might want to try installing it. Here's everything you need to know to get going. So the first step is to figure out where you're going to install. I strongly recommend you do not install on your primary production machine, either a separate hard drive to install on, or an entirely separate machine to install on. I do not recommend dual booting for a beginner. Run on over to DistroWatch, see which distribution looks the most appealing to you, because at the end of the day, they're basically all the same to install. This is the workflow. Pick the OS, go to that OS's website, download that OS's ISO. The ISO is the special installation image. The legacy way of using this would be to physically burn it to a DVD and then install from the DVD. As you may have noticed though, computers don't ship with CD drives anymore, so we put ISO images on USBs these days and install from a USB, or what we call a live USB. To create a live USB, there are a few options. For those Windows users out there, I recommend you use a piece of software called Rufus. For the Linux users out there, you can use UNet Boot-in, DD, or a piece of software called Janet. And that's not the only options, but those are the ones I'm going to go ahead and cover real quick. Rufus, it's pretty easy to download. Once you download it, you put your drive in, you run it, you select your ISO image, you hit start, Select DD mode, that's it. Here's UNet boot in. Make sure a USB is shown upon opening it. If not, you need to put a USB in and close it, reopen it. Select your ISO and hit the go button. It's pretty simple. Janet is a fancy command line environment that has a bunch of cool built-in commands to help you do Linux tasks. One of which is to create a live USB. You simply type in the path to the ISO and type in make USB. It asks you which device is your thumb drive and it does what it needs to do. And of course, this is really just a DD command. You could literally just run this DD command on any distro and that'll usually work. On Windows, after the drive has been made, you can pull out the drive and you're good to go. On Linux, after the drive has been created, I always recommend you type in the sync command and you're ready to go. We have a live USB now. The next step is to put that USB into the computer and then tell that machine to boot from the USB device. To get to the BIOS boot options is a little different on every machine. It could be F6, F8, F9, F1, Escape, Delete, and it really depends on the manufacturer of your machine. Most computers will tell you which button to press when it boots up. If it doesn't, try F1. Try escape, try delete, and keep rebooting until you figure it out. Once you do find the boot menu, scroll down to the name brand of your USB and hit enter, and you should see a grub screen with whatever distribution you chose. Partitioning is probably the trickiest thing to get your head around, but once you get partitioning down, there's not much more to learn before you can install every distribution you want. At the lowest level, a hard disk is a bunch of ones and zeros. In order to make those ones and zeros useful, we have to lay down a partition table. A partition table simply keeps track of all of the partitions on a disk. And they do this by using specific locations at the beginning of your disk to reference where the rest of the partitions are. And then, of course, you have partitions. They are the thing that holds files. There are two primary partition table types. You have MBR, which is the old one and not really needed if you have a UEFI BIOS, and you've got the new one, which is called GPT, but does require a UEFI BIOS to boot from. As most BIOSes are UEFI at this point, I strongly recommend you use GPT. GPT allows for more than four primary partitions, which means you can turn your physical hard disk into as many drives as you want. Okay, now we have a partition table. Let's talk about partition types. You have FAT32, which is going to be the one you use on small thumb drives in Windows, but it's also what you use for UEFI boot partitions. NTFS is the newer Windows file system. It is better than FAT32 as it can support more than 4 gigabyte files and very large partition sizes. Extent is my recommended Linux file system. Use the newest version, in this case, Extent 4. 
BTRFS is similar to Extent, except that it supports snapshotting. So you can snapshot your file system, break it, and then revert it back to how it was before. XFS is similar to Extent and NTFS. And of course, there's the swap partition type. Swap is cool. What it does is it uses part of your hard disk as virtualized RAM. So if your computer runs out of RAM, it starts using your hard disk for RAM. But RAM is way faster than your hard disk, so it's kind of like slow RAM. For a simple Linux install, we're going to use three partitions. The first partition we need is a FAT32 partition with a boot flag. It needs to be about a gig. The next partition we need can be most of the remaining disk. This will be where the OS and your home directory will go, and we'll call this one root. I recommend ext for this. And the last partition we're going to add is the swap partition. Stick to around 4 gigabytes. Alright, so quick recap. We're going to download an ISO, put that ISO on a USB using Rufus or UNet boot in or DD. Then we're going to put that USB in a machine, get to the boot menu in the machine, boot to the USB, go to the installer, partition a UEFI, BIOS, partition a root file system, and then partition swap. That's the gist. All right, let's download some distros. Download an Ubuntu. Downloading Mint. Downloading Pop! OS. Downloading Fedora. Downloading OpenSUSE. Let's install Ubuntu. Nice looking installer. It's pretty simple, you just hit next a bunch of times. We'll install the third party software because graphics are great and everyone likes MP3 files. For partitioning, you could do automatic partitioning for basically any distribution you want, especially if you're not afraid of losing any data on the disk. But as this is getting to know Linux, let's do manual partitioning for everything. We're going to create a new partition table. Add on here our EFI partition. We're going to add a 1 gigabyte UEFI system partition. We're going to add as big as we want root partition for all of our files. And then we're going to add some swap with whatever we got left. Good enough. And that's, that's it. It installs and it's installed. Cool. All right, let's install Mint. So we put the drive in of Mint. The installer looks more or less the same as Ubuntu, actually. We're going to install third party stuff. We're going to do something else for the partitioner. We're going to add a new partition table. Let's add our EFI boot partition. EFI system partition, excuse me. Let's add our root partition. And let's add our swap partition. We'll select our time zone, enter our username or password, and that's it. Pretty simple install. All right, let's install Pop Linux. Boot into the thumb drive. Okay, their installer is not based on the Ubuntu one. Looks very nice, kind of reminiscent of Mac OS X. We'll go for the advanced installer. Oh, this is a weird partitioner. It opens up Gparted for us to create the primary partitions. We'll just format things because it's already there. And then... Oh, weird. Then you select which partitions do what. I actually kind of like this. It's different than any of the other ones. Looks like this is a two-stage installer. We have to reboot. Okay, so it asks for things like Wi-Fi and time zone and user creation. Cool. Installed. Let's install Fedora. Their installer lets you go in any direction you want. Let's do disk partitioning. Select which disk you want. We'll remove 
things and add things back. System. All right. Let's add an EFI boot partition. Let's add a root partition. Let's add a swap partition. We'll just make all these standard. We don't need to use LVM. Make sure your time and date's right and you hit install. That's pretty cool. It also has a two-stage installer where we reboot and add our name after the, after the actual primary install. Cool. Next up is OpenSUSE. Boot to the drive. Select installation. Accept the user agreement. I go to configure online repositories because I prefer Mate. Let's go ahead and select Mate. Partitioning, we're going to start with an existing partition table. Just delete that stuff. Let's create a UEFI boot partition. Let's create a root partition. And a swap partition. Okay, cool. Next, we select our time zone. Then the username. We can make sure everything looks right or install additional software and hit install. All right, and that's installed. Let's go ahead and install VLC in all the different distributions and see how hard it is to get up and running. All right, in Ubuntu, if you type in VLC in the menu, it'll drop you right off to the Ubuntu store and let you install VLC from there. Pretty convenient. Linux Mint. There was no post installation. It literally just came with VLC working, so that's that's pretty easy. <laughs> Pop OS. Let's go to the store in Pop OS. Okay, and then we'll type in VLC and install. So it's pretty similar to the Ubuntu install path where you go to their store and install VLC. Fedora. In Fedora, they've separated a lot of the non-free software into a separate repository. You actually have to add this repository in order to install VLC. And let's do SUSE post install. In a similar vein to Fedora, you need to add a multimedia codec repository as well. When you add the multimedia codec, you're going to run into these conflicts. All you need to do is make sure you select vendor change. Some distributions are focused on advanced configuration and some distributions are focused on ease of use, but really it's it's a matter of what you like, so give a couple a try and see what sticks. Install some stuff. Bye. Get out of here. Be gone.